Today is February 13th, 2014. My name is Maureen Arthur and I'm interviewing Regina Vigil, who was affected by the 2013 flood in Lyons, Colorado. The interview is being filmed by Anne Marie Poise. I, I just like to correct what the my last name is Vihil. Vihil. Yeah. Oh great. Thank you. How are you today? Uh, as well as can be expected. Thank well, I wanted to start the interview with if you could tell us where and when you were born. I was born in New York City on September 12th, the night of the Lions Flood, but a different year, 1939. And how would you describe those early years living in New York City? What was your family life like? Um, I couldn't wait to get away from New York City. Uh, it was a very unhappy family. I had been in boarding school for seven years, and when we came home, there was the Bronx, surrounded by concrete buildings, and uh, it, it was a very unhappy time. My mother worked seven days a week, and my brother was a, an angry, brutal, three-year older brother. How was boarding school, and where was that? Boarding school, St. Clair's Academy, was about an hour from New York City, run by um, the St. Francis nuns. Uh, it was beautiful, it was wonderful. Lots of girls to play with, beautiful surrounding. It was, it was great. So those were, that was a happy place for you? Yeah. Would you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first year that my brother and I went, my mother, I was four years old. And my mother wanted to get away from my father. So she took us, I got a job at St. Clair's Academy. So my mother was there for a year with us. But after a year, she, my mother had five <coughs> sisters and everybody <coughs> lived in the Bronx. And my mother was really lonely and wanted to be around her sisters again. So she left my brother and I at St. Clair's Academy and then she went back to the Bronx. Um, okay, and then you continued your education through high school at the boarding school? No, I left the boarding school when I was 10 because my brother um, graduated from the eighth grade and St. Clair's Academy did not have a high school for the boys. So my mother took my brother and I back to the city. And then, so I went to the local uh, Catholic grammar school, Saint Sacred, Heart, Sacred Heart School. Did your family travel quite a bit or? No. My mother worked seven days a week. That's all she did. That's all she did was work. Yeah. Can you tell me what kind of work she did? She was a telephone operator. She worked for the New York Telephone Company Monday through Friday on the Grand Concourse. Uh, the, at that time, the operator, okay. So, and then on the weekend, she went down into Manhattan and worked at the Statler Hotel, again, as a telephone operator. Mm -hmm. So, um, at some point, why did you decide to come to Colorado? Well, I graduated, f everyone in my world at that time, all the girls were programmed to be um, girlfriends and then wives and then mothers and live happily ever after in that world. And it never interested me to do that. So when I graduated from high school with my secretarial degree, um, I got a job in Manhattan at the um, William Douglas McAdams uh, medical advertising firm, and everyone in that firm was Jewish. And people started saying to me, why aren't you going to college? Well, no one in my world went to college. And people, <laughs> I remember going, being taken to a, uh, see a movie and the movie was in a foreign language and you had to read subtitles at the bottom. I never, never saw anything like that. I was taken to the, the New York Public Library and so the idea of college then was now in my mind. So to get to college I had to go back and finish two years of high school 
because in high school I took stenography and business machines and you know a bit for the business world so I had to go back which I did um, at night uh, for two years to get to take these academic classes and I and everybody at William Douglas McAdams either recommended I go to uh, the University of Colorado in Boulder or the University of Wisconsin in Madison so I wrote to both schools and uh, the University of Colorado accepted me on condition so I got on a bus and I traveled from New York City to Denver Colorado and I couldn't believe it. It's like all the people were on the East Coast and all the land was in front of me. Got off the bus and I could look straight ahead and see the sky. In New York, if you want to see the sky, it's more like this. And it was a, a totally different world. But anyway, so that's how I, I, I went to summer school. I took English and something else and the University of Colorado accepted me on condition. And, and so, how did you feel when you were actually living and going to college in Boulder? In the I early was so days? happy to be away from the Bronx. I, I wouldn't care if I ever saw my mother and brother again. Uh, it was great. It was beautiful. And it was interesting. So I got the cheapest room at, at Farron Hall, of course, because money was a real issue for me. And, um, but I was from New York City and that gave me instant prestige. You know, I remember talking to a girl from Old Colorado, you're from New York City. And I thought, you're from Old Colorado? It was, uh, it, it was quite, quite amazing. How did you finance your college education? Well, the two years that I had to go back to night school for high school, um, I was working full time and I saved my money. And then I got a job as a, um, uh, I got a job living in somebody's house for room and board. So, you know, I cleaned and cooked and did whatever. And then um, after that, I got a job at um, the student center and I worked at the student center. Well, tell me about what you studied. What were your interests in college? Well, when I went, got to Boulder, I turned into my mother. My mother worked seven days a week. And when I got to Boulder, that's basically what I did. I went to work, I got up, I went to classes, and then I went to the library to study, and then I went back to work, and then I went home to sleep. So basically, I turned into my mother. And, um, I was always interested or curious about art and then I met the man I eventually married and the father of my son um, and then I began meeting people in the art department, the fine arts department and I got very interested in art. So my major, I majored in fine arts and I minored in history and uh, I eventually graduated. Did you return to New York? Did the fine arts degree make you appreciate New York a little no, more? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. But I remember one, one year I wanted to go back to New York for Christmas. This was before I met my husband um, in my, the end of my sophomore year. So this was before that. And I wanted to go back to New York and uh, there was an ad in the paper, a writer, was going to New York and was looking for writers. So I called, he comes over to pick me up and we're all gonna drive to New York City. And he was a black man and I was shocked. I had never really been met a black person before. So I got into his car and then we went to pick up the second writer who was also going to New York and he was another black man, another black student. So in short, I went across the United States with in the car of five black men, and I was the only female and the only white female. And we stopped in Pittsburgh to, to drop off one of the guys. 
and there was a sea of black people and I had never seen so many black people in my life and people were really nice to me and kind to me and so uh, then Big Daddy took me to the Bronx and I went upstairs to my mother's fifth floor apartment and and when she found out that I came cross country with five boys she was appalled and I thought, well, I won't tell her the rest. But anyway, these five guys, uh, when we got back to Boulder, um, we remained friends forever. When you graduated, did you work in your field in fine arts? When, well, so I'm majoring in fine arts. The University of Colorado at the time, the fine arts department would pay prestigious artists to come for summer school. So one summer, um, David Hockney, he was there for the summer, and Joan Brown and Manuel Neary, who had been teaching at the San Francisco Art Institute. When Joan and Manuel were there, we had an incredible summer. It was an amazing summer. And even though I had not graduated, I, I needed one semester left to graduate, I decided, my friend Marsha and I decided to go to San Francisco. So we went to San Francisco. Now this is San Francisco in the 60s. And it was an incredible place. So I went to the San Francisco Art Institute and I worked for the post office part time. And then Carmen came out from Boulder and so he was there. Then I decided to come back to Boulder because I only had one semester left to graduate. Graduated and went back to San Francisco and stayed there for years. Carmen and I got married and then I got pregnant and Joseph was born. And um, I went to San Francisco State to get my lifetime teaching credentials. So I did that when I got that, then I, I got a teaching job in Marin County and I lived in Marin County for about three years after that. But then I decided I missed Colorado and my friends were coming back and uh, so I came back to Boulder. So describe how you felt when you came back. Was it a different place than you no. had left so many? No, I was older. Mm -hmm. um, I had a son. Um, no, my college friends, whom I still am in close contact with, um, were were here, and it was very nice. It was very nice. So I rented a, a small cottage in Boulder, and stayed there on Arapahoe Street until one day the landlord uh, Lauren came over and he said, "Well, I hate to do this, but I have to raise your rent." And I, I really didn't like that a bit. So I got the uh, Boulder Daily Camera, I guess it was, and looked in the real estate section, and there was a small ad that said, House and Lions for sale, owner um, will whatever, will handle it, will carry, carry it. So, um, so I got the house in, Bold in Lions, and I moved there, and I, so I moved to Lyons because my rent in Boulder had been raised. What year was that? Well, Joseph was born in 69. It was 19, well, hmm, it must have been 1976 because the first night I lived in my house in Lyons was the night of the Big Thompson flood in 1976, and Boulder, uh, um, the Big Thompson flooded, Lyons did not flood it, but it was a horrific monsoon. And I remember being in my new Lyons house, everything's in boxes and suitcases. My dog was on my bed, my cat was on my bed, I was on my bed, Just was on my bed, and I thought, if this is a typical Lyons storm, I don't want to live here. And the next morning I found out that the Big Thompson had flooded. So Highway 7 and 36 did not flood no, during that flood. No, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So yeah. when were you in the Peace Corps? Was it chronologically, what year was that? I was in the Peace Corps the first time in 1980, and I went to Chile. Um, Joseph, Joseph's dad um, met 
Susan and they got married and they had a child and lived in San Francisco. So uh, my son's father and um, his second wife and their son were in San Francisco. And Joseph stayed with me in the winter, stayed, went to school in Colorado, and then in the summer he would go to San Francisco and be with his dad because I did not know my dad and I wanted my son to know his father. And, uh, but one, one May or June, Joseph wanted to play Little League. So he played Little League, which meant he didn't go to San Francisco until maybe three weeks later than he normally would have gone. And um, he, he wanted more time with his father. So he wanted to stay in San Francisco. And so I thought, well, so if Joseph stays with his father, I am free to do whatever it is I want to do. And uh, I don't have to be a mother. Um, so I decided what I wanted was I wanted to learn Spanish and I wanted to travel. And the Peace Corps was perfect. So I applied and that's when I was assigned to Chile. And then in December of that year, so 1980, we were talking about. Um, Joseph wanted to come down and visit me over Christmas break. And, uh, and, uh, and his father and I have always agreed on what was best for Joseph. That, that was never a conflict between us. Um, so Joseph came down and he wanted to stay. And so Joseph stayed with me in Chile mm. uh, for a year. And then when my two years was up, um, he went back to San Francisco and then CARE Chile offered me a job. So I stayed in Chile for about seven months longer. So the Peace Corps allowed children to come? No, in? actually they, the Peace Corps does not or did not allow children at that time. But we got um, a new director, uh, new directors. It was a, a couple that were um, married and they had been in Ecuador in the Peace Corps years earlier. And they had adopted three children and had one biological child. So they were very focused on children and family. And when I went up and asked uh, Rhoda Brooks, who was the director, if I could, I wanted Joseph to stay with me. And she said, all right. And then they gave me a small stipend for him so it was very, very nice, but that was atypical. That was not yeah. usual. Yeah. What did you do in the Peace Corps? Can you describe that time? I can, actually, because I was there. <laughs> I remember it. Uh, I was in a school gardens program because Chile had a lot, had a lot of land. It, it was an agricultural country. And um, there had been an agreement made between the Peace Corps and the UN at the time that there was going to be a, a joint project to get um, get some of the land that was not being used turned into school gardens and the produce from the gardens would be used as a lunch program. So after a year the uh, UN pulled out. They were not interested in continuing so that project was taken over by the, the Peace Corps. So originally it was the Peace Corps was going to provide the personnel and the UN would provide seeds and tools, et, et cetera. So this was your first interest in gardening that you... When I lived in Boulder, um, the landlord who was like my age, he had a garden. And I had never been around gardens before, and I was astounded to see you actually put a seed in the ground and something comes up. I mean, it was totally magical. It was really magical. And the house in Lyons has a big backyard, and so I, I started a garden right away. But from the Peace Corps experience, I got, I got training and I learned some things, yeah. So that was your first time in the Peace Corps, then you came back? First time in the Peace Corps, mm -hmm. and then 10 years later, I decided I wanted to go back. So this time it's uh, 1990, and I applied for um, teaching English as a foreign language in Slovakia, in Eastern Europe. 
That was a marvelous what was that experience. Like? Wow, Eastern Europe is amazing. So Slovakia had been part of Czechoslovakia, and it's a wonderful country. So I was working with seniors in high school, and seniors in high school that had an incredible history of knowing about art and culture and music, and the arts were absolutely ingrained in their being. And um, the, the people, the students were incredibly impressive. And if you judge a country by its youth, Slovakia is a wonderful country. So the arts were really high quality in the high schools? It was ingrained in them. You know, when I came back, I got a job at Nywood High School here in Boulder County. And Nywood High School, a lot of the parents have PhDs. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a good school. And one, one time the students were going to put on an event, right? And they got their material from television. Whereas in Slovakia, um, when, when students, they were so creative, they, they didn't use television as their guide. They used literature and art and music. And, and it was just, it was very different, very different. So when you returned to Lyons, you decided to stay and live in Lyons when you came back from Slovakia? Yes, and I had rented out my house. Um, in, uh, renting in Lyons was no problem. I always rented out when I was going to be away for a year or two years or whatnot. Yeah, but I kept the house. And you still felt the same about Lyons? Well, yeah. I wanted um, a small town that was pretty and quiet. And your pen, is that what you're looking for? No. Oh, sorry. No. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it's been a very nice place to live. Do you find it peaceful and enough activities for you? I don't want activities. I mean, I, you know, Oscar Blues and Planet Bluegrass and everything has exploded for the town. We have a mayor who's very interested in promoting business. I, I wasn't interested, and I'm not interested in any of that. I just want a pretty quiet place to live where no one will drop by. <laughs> well, <clears throat> let's talk about the flood. Um, mm -hmm. Can you describe September 12th, two 2014? I can describe September 12th, which as I said was my birthday. And um, I live with Greg Miller. He and I were home. And at 2.30 in the morning, the loudspeakers went, oh, and this is the sheriff, uh, evacuate your house immediately, the river has crested, go to higher ground. So we just, I have a, a camper, a Eurovan camper, we just threw some clothes and some food in the camper and went up on Upper Prospect, which is probably the steepest hill in town. And Was I, the river up at that time when no, you? No, yeah. no, it was filling up. I mean, it was dark and, you know, I didn't really pay. No, I don't think I even walked through. What water. did you think when you heard the sirens? Well, as, as was said, this is not a test. This is the real thing. And uh, it was time to get out. It was time to get out of Dodge. Yeah, so we just got in the van, went up the hill, and we slept in the van for three days. And the hill, we're on the hill looking down Prospect Street so I could see the water. And I could see all the water around my house. And Prospect Street became Prospect River. Um, it was an amazing sight. On the 13th or 14th of September, um, the town had meetings. Yes. And we were asked to evacuate. Did you evacuate? Yes. I was at that meeting. And um, yeah. All the electricity was gonna was either off or whatever, and I remember since we were up on Upper Prospect, there was a street, and I was we were parked in front of somebody's house. He came down and he said, "Well, there's not going to be any electricity, so the half a side of beef I just put in my freezer is going to be bad. So let's get the grills out and grill all this meat." So that night we had this great party up there. I hadn't tasted filet mignon in years, and it was darn good. <laughs> Did you see your neighbors evacuating, or? That, uh, no. At that time? No. Uh, Pam in the dome. Uh, I don't know where she No, I didn't see anybody. I didn't see anybody. Um, 
So where did you evacuate to after when we had to leave Lyons? Yeah, um, we uh, rented a condo in, in Longmont, and so we were there for about three and a half months. How was your daily life over there? Good. It, being in a, a I just, um, the condo was uh, owned by a friend of mine who was living in Texas, taking care of her grandchildren. And um, I, I went back to Lyons every day and tried to start cleaning up and, you know, moving things. And so I came back to Lyons every day, three and a half months. How did you feel when you first saw your neighborhood and your house? Uh, it's absolutely shocking. It's like Hiroshima. I mean, I had never seen such um, devastation. And even now, I live on, you know, I'm back in my house. There would normally be 12 families that live on Prospect Street. I'm the only homeowner that moved back. And three of the other houses at my end of Prospect, which is the West End, ha, ha, they've been rented out. So there are renters living mm -hmm. in those houses. So on a, on a street where 12 families could live, four families are living there. The other houses are a shell of a house. What no made doors, the difference no between your house and your neighbor's house? Well, houses? one thing is I was on the upper end of the street, which was higher. And uh, about 10 years or so ago, I wanted to refinance my house. No, no, no. In 76, so it would have been a, probably about 1980, um, I had a chance to get some federal money. Uh, so I paid off my three mortgages and just had one mortgage. And I, elevate, I had the house elevated, which was mandatory if I wanted this federal money. And so the house was elevated to the floodplain. And that's why on this flood, um, the water got to my back door but didn't go in the house because the house had been elevated. Do you, do you know if that area had flooded in the past? Well, um, I don't know, but someone wrote fairly recently a letter to the editor in the old Lions recorder and talked about the history of flooding in Lyons. And there were, there were one or two floods. Um, yes, there had been floods, but I, di I didn't really even think, you know, 100 year floodplain. Sure, that's cool. Won't be around when, when it floods, but I was. And what, be. Um, when you went home and, um, can you tell how you felt or what it looked like when you would go to the park from your house, go walk? That's a place you used to walk quite a bit. On the other side of the river you're mm -hmm. talking about. Yeah, I never thought it was, uh, it was a park. It was flat. And then when Planet Bluegrass and, you know, had their concerts, it was full of campers and whatnot. And today? And today, it's still a mess. The trailer, car, uh, the trailer park behind my house has been cleaned out somewhat, but there are trailers on their sides. Uh, There's still, uh, it, it looks like a war zone, and nobody lives there. And mud, of course, is everywhere. How high was the mud by your house? Well, it got, it got to the top of my, um, my back door. So uh, three steps down, and it was uh, at that was the floodplain level. So it when I took some photos since when we left and we parked up on Upper Prospect, I we could see down Prospect, and um, the first day so it would have been 12, 13, 14, about the 15th, or the. 14th, I took my iPhone, I, I went down, we went into the water and I shot um, videos of my house and I could see the water. And that was uh, almost knee deep. I, could, I was holding on to Greg, the power of the water was strong. And uh, it, it, was a, it was an amazing sight. It's an amazing sight. Have you been able to reconnect with your neighbors? Who, oh, yeah. who aren't back in their homes? Or? No. The people who are, well, the fellow across the street, he's not in his home. 
he and his family had just moved from Alaska and I think he owned the house a month, two months, and then it was flooded. So uh, if he wants to rebuild now, of course, he has to elevate the house, a floodplain plus three feet, and I don't think he's going to do it. Nobody else at that end of the street. How many, how many people do you think had flood insurance in your neighborhood? I had flood insurance. Pam and the Dome did not. The Gorensons to the east did. Um, I don't know about any of the other families, but I do know that their, their structures are just structures. They're not fixing up those houses, which makes me, and nobody's living in those houses, but I don't think anybody, hardly anybody had flood insurance. Did you ever hear that the, um, the route that the river took was changed in the 1940s? Have you heard? No. Yeah. Is that true? I'm not sure. Yeah. But I thought maybe you might know. No. The idea of changing the route of a river, I mean, that's an amazing, amazing thing to think about. I never thought about the river at all. But I do remember the night that I moved in and there was that monsoon and the rain but it didn't flood that night. And I always thought if, if you know, 100 year floodplain, it's, we're gonna flood in the, f in the spring with the snow melt. I never thought about rain. Are you worried about this spring? Absolutely, absolutely. It's gonna flood again. Let's talk a little bit about the help that you got and the relief. Um, how would you begin to describe um, when you went home and started to repair and who helped you? Well, I saw all these volunteers, groups of volunteers, and it seemed to me that they were mainly Christian groups, Christian ministries, um, and I just went up and asked who was in charge of this group, and I told them I could use some help. I've had fantastic help from these wonderful giving people who, are, who come and work hard and they've, uh, they've helped move mud, they've helped move. I had a, um, in the back of the house, I had a little guest cottage and all my winter, all my, let's see, it was winter clothes, storage, everything, all flooded, all flooded. All that stuff had to be thrown out. And this, uh, the first group was uh, Christian Ministries. They were like five, four or five, young men who were about 19 years old. They were incredible workers, uh, very generous in doing what they did. It was really very impressive. They were from out of state? Out of state, and all, practically all of the groups, and I've had quite a few come and help me, they've all been from out of state. Um, there was a, a group of Jewish volunteers, I don't know where they were from, from, but Ohio and Minnesota and uh, yeah, people really worked hard. It was really very, very impressive. So did, did you move home before, um, before you really had services? Or? No, no. M did I move back to line? Right. No. As soon as we got services, which was three and a half months later, yeah, we moved back. How was that? Um, well, we didn't have, uh, well, the first I hired a group to, I was real concerned about mold and everything was damp. Um, and these, these volunteer groups would pump out the water from underneath my house. Yeah. I had the water pumped out 12 times and 12 times the water came back because the land was so saturated. So it just kept leaching out and running down? Yes. And um, how did I feel about being back there? I don't know, because then I began f hearing all these rumors about, well, this is now the floodplain, and now you can't. They don't want anyone living in the floodplain, which I totally agree with. Um, and then the possibility is, so do I. I wanted everything in my house uh, repainted and whatnot. And then I began looking around, I thought, place doesn't need to be repainted, it needs to be washed. And I need to make sure everything is washed again. 
So volunteers came and they helped wash the walls, the ceilings, everything, the floors, everything. And I didn't bring anything back into the house, clothing, most of the cushions and stuff like that I threw away because they were wet and because I'm real concerned about mold. So I hired someone for, how much did I pay? $13,000 or $20,000 for them to come clean out the mold and give me an estimate that it was livable and so on and so forth. So I had all that done. I had everything done because I thought, this is my house. What if I sell my house so I have some money, but I have no house, I have no place to live. So I don't, I don't know what I'm gonna do if the 404 program actually comes through. Could you tell about the 404 program? Evidently, the town of Lyons has applied for either FEMA or federal money. The money is given to the town to buy out people like me, homeowners who live in the floodplain. So at, at pre-flood levels, um, so that the, no one will live there because they don't want anyone living in the So floodplain. they would pay pre-flood prices, what your house was valued at? Prior to the flood. Well, that's the rumor. But the reality is right now, we don't know if the town has actually, is going to get 404 buyout money. It's all iffy. So there, nothing's definite yet. Is that frustrating? It's extremely frustrating. It's extremely frustrating. Are you working with someone or can you tell me, you know, do you have a liaison with uh, someone from the program? Well, um, I got the name of someone, Rosie, and my son is an architect in Boulder and has worked with Boulder County Housing and wants to help the town of Lyons recover. So he and I went and met with Rosie and, um, and got more info. I got the information they had, but they still don't have a lot of information. What's the time frame? For them. Do well, they... I thought I'm not. I'm not. I'm not really clear about this. In fact, I'm pretty unclear about this. That the town has either applied for, or will hear by March, and then there'll be a period of time. There'll be, my understanding, and this may be totally wrong. My understanding is the town will get a certain amount of money. As soon as that money is spent, that's it. So. The town has tried to figure out, they want to serve people who need it the most. So homeowners who have 50%, um, muscle minus 50% damage, those people will be priority, have a priority for the buyout. And I have been uh, estimated at 10% loss um, because my living space was not affected uh, my crawl space, which was where my heater, furnace, the pipes, all that was flooded and all that had to be replaced at $30,000 uh, worth. Um, that's as much as I know at this point. How did you feel about the compensation from the FEMA um, program? FEMA, with, you know, FEMA was wonderful. I mean, they gave me money to rent in Longmont. And, and it wasn't a big deal with other people as well. If you needed to, uh, needed help uh, with paying your rent so you could live someplace else, FEMA was there, it was marvelous. And the Salvation Army and the Red Cross, man, they were there. They were giving food to people who were working in town. I never really thought about what the Salvation Army did or the Red Cross, you know. Uh, but boy, I know now. And every time I see them, I give them money. It's impressive how helpful they were. But these 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 Christian volunteers, well, and they're, they're still coming. You know, there's a Lions volunteer group on a Wednesday and Saturday. They do volunteer work. And uh, I've had, um, you know, people from town that I've seen that work in Dorothy's, the health food store. Um, just, it's been really impressive. How do you feel about the future in Lyons? Do you see yourself staying here? Or are you conflicted about what you're planning to do? I'm very conflicted. Because if indeed the floodplain, which is where my house is, if 
and the other end of Prospect Street, and as I said, none of those houses are being lived in. They're going to be torn down or condemned. And I assume the town or the county will, I live in the Confluence area, it will become a park. It'll be like you just asked me about the park on the other side of the river pre-flood. I figure that's what this side of the river is going to be. And, uh, and I thought, well, it's not so bad. I don't mind living around the park. But when I talked to Rosie uh, from the town for an update about 404, she mentioned that the Lions Parks are heavily used. There are a lot of people. Um, it may be a park and I'll be surrounded by tenters and picnickers and I have no idea what it's going to look like um, because we don't, we don't know yet what's going to happen with the confluence area. So if you were offered a buyout um, by the 404 program, would, do you think you might do that? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know because, you know, I've lived a long time and my son will inherit my house. Um, you know, he went to Lyons Junior Senior High School and uh, he'll never, he and his family will never live in Lyons. They have a great house in Boulder. But if I don't buy out my house, this house will never be saleable. Who would buy a house in a floodplain where you're not supposed to live? Nobody. So uh, I'm conflicted. I, you know, th the reality is he will not, uh, I would like him to inherit something. And he's not going to inherit if I keep, keep the house. But where am I going to live? I won't get, I still have a $60,000 mortgage on my house, um, even pre-flood prices, if the house was sold, wouldn't give me a lot of money. I couldn't buy a house in, in Boulder, not with the amount of money I have available. And I'm just too old. I don't want another house. I mean, I have a house, so I, I really haven't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I could keep the house, but I've spent $30,000 already for hot water heater, furnace, pipes, um, but the crawl space is not insulated as it was before the flood. When they came to redo the electricity, he went up to the attic and uh, it, the attic was totally insulated. The house was very, very warm, and now the house, and I know it's been cold, but the house is not warm. And so do I, if I, if, if I was going to stay there and I knew that or made that decision, I would have the uh, insulation put back in, on, in the crawl space and in the attic, you know. So I'm really, do I want to spend another penny on this house where I may not be able to live? So it's very iffy. What do you think is going to help you determine what you do? Well, I know whatever it is I do will be the right decision because I have confidence in, in that, in my own abilities and uh, um, whatever I decide, I'll make the best of. I just, at this point, I don't really know. I mean, I come here and I see they're starting these greens for the garden, which I would be doing. And, uh, you know, my, my backyard is still under a lot of mud and silt and sand and my garden is I don't know how long it's going to take for the the soil in my garden to be producing again but I have five apple trees and the apple trees have survived mm. my house was built in 1905 and it was the first house in that block it was all apple orchards and um, Pam in the Doan I think she has about 13 apple trees left but everybody else has cut down their apple, apple trees. Uh, but I still have five, and I'll be, I'm real curious in the spring what's going to come up, what it's going to look like. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us well, or that you'd like to add? I feel really badly for people like Pam in the Dome. You know, she works all day. She works with seniors, so you know she's not making a lot of money. Did she have flood insurance? Hell, she doesn't even have health insurance. And um, she wants to stay in Lyons. Um, you know, 
on the east side, Gorenson, he owns that house and it's, uh, he rents it out. Um, so I, I feel badly for the people who have, who have no insurance. I have health insurance. I have flood insurance. Um, and my, my house was elevated, so I don't, yeah, I feel, it's strange, you know, at night now, um, it's pitch black because there's nobody living on the street and nobody behind the behind me in the trailer park and it's and I, I love the fact that it's finally really dark and you can go outside and you can look up and see the stars but um, and I've always liked Prospect Street because it was away from downtown Lyons where all the activity was going on um, and it's gonna the how the town's going to change. How would you feel if they develop um, <clears throat> uh, a, na a new neighborhood? I've heard there are plans to rebuild. Um, I'm not sure where, but I think they're working on that. How would you feel about a new neighborhood? Well, my son, you know, is an architect and he's he's interested in affordable housing and he's worked for the county and we've looked around where could a new neighborhood be? A new neighborhood, affordable housing could actually be built west of the high school. There are, you know, where um, these fields are. Um, other than that, I don't know where else there, there have been some recommendations about build here or build there, but we can't build by the river. It's going to flood again and it's going to happen again. And even if, if house, affordable, uh, affordable housing was built by the river and it was elevated, the flood's going to wipe it all out, uh, you know, so. I don't, I don't know. But what I, percentage of people in your neighborhood do you think are, are trying to stay in Lyons? I don't know. Um, I know Pam. Pam in the dome wants to stay. Okay, we need to stop right now. It's in the future. And, I mean, see, this is, I mean, we're off. Oh, sorry. Whatever else you'd like to add about how you feel about lions in the future? Well, because of Oscar Blues and Planet Bluegrass, a lot, it seems, a lot of artists, um, musicians uh, have come to town, and I really like that. It's not something I'm especially interested in, in interacting with, uh, because I, I don't like groups. I don't want to be around groups. I just kind of want to mind my own business. And, uh, um, but the town is changing. The town is definitely changing. We'll see what happens, but I won't be living here. I'm not gonna be, uh, you know, I'm 74. That's old enough. I've lived long enough. Uh, people talk about 10 years, 20 years. I don't have that, and I don't want it. Well, I wish you all the best with your future plans and to the town of Lyons, too. Yeah. Thank you.